All right, if you would, come in and find a seat. It is time for our second session of the morning. I am very often asked, what is the future of the Preterist movement? Now, part of that question is couched in terms that I find a little disturbing because it is couched within the context of, you know, those of you guys who are pretty active right now are getting kind of old. And uh, we are. I'm 67 years old. Who knows how many years the Lord will give me to be active and doing what I love to be doing. I told somebody just the other day, I, uh, they asked me what I did and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, I'll be really honest with you. I am having more fun doing what I'm doing than anybody ought to be allowed to have. I mean, I, 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 I am. I cannot tell you how much I enjoy sharing God's Word and studying and learning and doing this, all right? We do want the movement to move and to advance. It has been a thrill to see young men like Alan Bondar and Boone, what's it, what's it? David Boone, yeah, that's right, David Boone. I started to say Daniel, but I you know, <laughs> had Daniel on the mind for some reason. Uh, those, I tell you what, they, they've both spoken here in the past. They both did a fantastic job. They're bright, bright young men. And last year at Memphis, I think that was last year, wasn't it, Daniel? Uh, I was there to speak at William Bell's lectureship. I had been hearing about Daniel Rogers. I'd never met him, but William told me that he was going to have him speaking. And I sat and I listened, and I texted my wife, because she wasn't there, and I said, we found a speaker for next year. And she said, well, who is it? And I said, well, his name is Daniel Rogers, and he's good. I was deeply, deeply impressed by the organization, by the depth, by the research that was in his lesson. And I spoke to William about that. I spoke to some others. I know that Holger knew him before I did. Steve Baisden knew him before I did. I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Uh, and those are men that have a really high regard for the Lord and his truth. And so I was very, very impressed. And so I spoke to Daniel after that lectureship. I asked him if he would speak for us. He, he graciously accepted. And then he and I began corresponding on a very regular basis, talking on the phone, emailing, texting, and what have you. And he mentioned a manuscript that he had written. And he was hoping to one day to be able to get it published. And I said, well, perhaps I can help with that. And I asked him to submit the manuscript to me. And when I read it, I just thought, well, my first impression of Daniel Rogers was absolutely correct. Here's a young man. You still 24? Oh, oh to be 24 again. <laughs> As here is a young man that has done a lot of thought, a lot of research. He has an ability to communicate some profound concepts in a simple, easy to read manner. And he gave us the honor of publishing his very first book. It's on the table back there. It is entitled, The Last Enemy and the Triumph of Christ. It is on 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I don't have to tell you how difficult a chapter that is, how difficult a subject resurrection is, but I want to recommend very, very, very highly to you that, that you get a copy of Daniel's book. And you're going to be amazed at how simply we can understand some of those deeper concepts that are there. The linguistic work that he does, for instance, on the words that Paul uses for corruption, incorruption, mortal, immortality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, look, just those linguistic studies are more, more than well worth the price of the book. 
And he's told me he's already working on some manuscripts for some additional books. I told him, I said, look, we need, a, we need more short, well-written, easy to understand books to give to people so that they can understand some of the deeper things that we are talking about. He said he's still working. He's working right now on getting some of those done. I am just very, very thrilled and confident to think about the future of covenant eschatology and preterism when we have young men like Daniel Rogers, and there's some others that are coming up that I hope to be introducing to you in the very near future at other Preterist Pilgrim Weekends. The future is bright. The future is exciting. And Daniel Rogers is one of the reasons, so help me welcome Daniel Rogers. It is such an honor to be with you this year at the 2017 Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. I was uh, absolutely delighted to be asked by Don to speak this year. And I want to tell you a little bit about how the first, about, about the first conversation I ever had with uh, Don Preston. I was studying preterism and I was trying my best to do it independently. Um, I did not want to really read any material or watch any videos or anything like that until I came to a conclusion myself. And that's the same way I am on a lot of subjects. I would rather have the Bible influence me and then go to a resource and see what else they have to say about it before, I, it's, it's weird, but I don't want somebody to, <laughs> I guess it's the whole depending on the Bible and not man thing that, they, that I get that from, but I try to learn from the Bible what the subject says first, and then I'll go to secular sources to see what they might have to say about that subject to, to sort of spruce it up a bit. Well, I was doing that with preterism in the summer of 2015, and every passage that I studied, the closer I got to full preterism. I had maybe 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 left, and I was standing on the edge of this cliff and staring off into the void. And I had a sneaky suspicion where I was about, what I was about to do, and that was take the plunge. And so I got on Facebook, and I looked up Don Preston's name, and I sent him a message, and I thought, he's probably not even going to respond to this. So I sent a message, and I said, I've got to know where this leads. What do you believe about this, 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 and this? And he sent me back, and I was satisfied with his answers. And so then about a month or so later, I was studying 1 Corinthians 15. I read Isaiah 25 and 26 and 27, and then I jumped. I mean, he probably doesn't even remember that, but, but I did message him and said, what am I jumping into exactly? And it turns out it's a, it's a pool of freedom and a pool of liberty and happiness and joy and grace that I've never felt before in my entire life. And I can stand before you. And I can stand before you today and proclaim to you the word of God as I see it. And to be quite honest, if you disagree with me, what you've done to me or what you will do to me is nothing in comparison to the pain that I had to feel when I told uh, my loved ones of what I believed about the Bible and being rejected by them. So if you disagree with this lesson, I will gladly hear it because uh, I've gotten very used to in the past year of taking, uh, <laughs> taking criticism and not much of it has been very constructive. So uh, with that being said, today I'm going to be d discussing the defeat of Satan and the end of the millennium. Now the PowerPoint that you're going to see uh, is different than what you're going to download, but it's only different visually because of the contrast on the screen behind me. So don't worry about it. It looks different, but it's the same PowerPoint. The subtitle of this lesson is The Cross, the Parousia, and the Defeat of Satan. And of course, the first part of that subtitle is based off the book The Cross and the Parousia, the Two Dimensions of One Age-Changing Eschaton uh, by Max King. And this is where I get some of the themes that I'm going to be talking about within this presentation without actually quoting from or directly referencing any of his particular works. Just sort of the broad theme came from the whole meaning of that, of that book. I also want to tell you this PowerPoint is available for download in both a PowerPoint form, and if you're on your phone, it's also on an outline form, uh, just taken directly from the PowerPoint. None of it has any additional information, so you're not missing anything by downloading one and not downloading the other so that you can access this PowerPoint and follow along with me, and so you don't have to worry about writing down every little point. I want you to listen to me, not, not have to write down all the points. So I've got this PowerPoint uh, for you to, to download. And also, 
I'm going to be getting Mike's PowerPoint. He's sent it over to me. That excellent lesson, and I don't know how I'm going to follow it, uh, but I'm going to put his PowerPoint on the website as well. Same link, labornotinvain.com backslash PPW2017. You'll be able to download my point PowerPoint there, and whenever I get a free moment, you'll be able to download his there as well. When we talk about the defeat of Satan, we have to deal with some words that are going to trip us up. Many religious words that are found in the Bible have been hijacked by the evolution of our English language, by translations, by church traditions, by misinterpretations, and even pop culture, especially when you get into discussion of the devil and Satan and their defeat. Words like church, angels, hell, resurrection, Satan, the devil, and any other number of words that you can point out, especially for some reason when it comes to eschatology, have gained a lot of baggage over the years uh, due to traditions and pop culture and, and uh, misinterpretations and things like that. So when we come to the scripture and when we read a word like hell, or when we, we, when we read a word like the church, sometimes we never stop to think about the Greek words behind our English words. We never stop to think about how the word church inside the scripture is used to talk about an assembly of Gentiles who are going to try to persecute the church. <laughs> it's not always a reference. It's not always a reference to the body of Christ. When we read the word hell, we never think how the word Gehenna is used. And you start to wonder when you read Matthew chapter 5, what authority the Sanhedrin council had to cast somebody into the lake of fire, right? And so when we read these English words, Sometimes we carry a lot of baggage with that, and it's extremely difficult to leave that baggage behind, especially when we study the topic of the defeat of Satan, which is also called the devil. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, we read about Jesus being tempted by Satan. And in Mark chapter 1, we read about Jesus being tempted by the devil. So these are both two words used to describe uh, this same the same being that we're discussing that's going to be destroyed at the end of the millennium uh, from the context of the biblical point of view. And in fact, the, the focus of our lesson today is trying to study the defeat of Satan in conjunction with the end of the millennium. Because if we can pinpoint when Satan would be defeated, then we have the proper framework for the end of the millennium. Moving on, we see that we can fix this problem. When you think of words like the devil and Satan, uh, one of the things that you come to mind is something like you see there on the right. Go to church or the devil will get you. He's walking about like a roaring lion seeking who may, he may devour. So if you're not sitting in that pew at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday, the devil's going to come and snatch you up when you leave these doors today. Well, the Bible does not always picture um, the devil in this way. And in fact... In fact, that's a subject that I have to study more on, the, the exact nature and the exact person of Satan. But there is a remedy to this problem. We need to substitute uh, the literal translation of the Greek words into our studies in order to have a better understanding of what the Bible is trying to convey. If it conveys the picture of a red man with horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork, then so be it. But if the Bible does not convey that picture in a particular passage, we have no right whatsoever to read into the text presuppositions that we have uh, regarding that word or the usage of that word. The same thing, the same thing is true with resurrection. The same thing is true with the end. When we read 1 Peter 4, and it says the end of all things is at hand, and we say, okay, that's the end of the Jewish age, but we go to 1 Corinthians 15, and it says, then comes the end, we have no right to read into that passage something that isn't there. We have no right to read that that's the end of time. It has to be the same end that's discussed, first of all, uh, two other or three other times in the book of 1 Corinthians, and in all, of, uh, in all the Bible as well. But we have a bad habit of reading into a passage, uh, a particular idea, just because we see something that we don't like, that doesn't fit our presuppositions, or that we, see, we try to read a word a certain way when it's not meant that way. So in the course of this lesson... We're going to allow the Bible to continue, the translation of the Bible to continue to use the words Satan and, and the devil, but we're going to use the literal translation of those words, adversary and slanderer, in order to try to get to what the Bible says and not what, well, to be honest, not what the Catholic Church says, not what mythology says. 
We want what the scriptures say. Now, while I have not, at this moment, just to let you know where I'm at, while I've not abandoned the traditional view of Satan as of yet, I do believe that there are far more passages in the Bible that use these words, Satan and the devil, to represent those in opposition to God's scheme of redemption than there are to point to another worldly, uh, another worldly being. In the, name of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the words of Travis Finley, you have two boxes. You have a preterist box and a futurist box. And as you begin to move from partial preterism to full preterism or true preterism, you begin to fill those boxes up with scriptures. And you take a look and you say, well, I've got 99 passages inside the preterist box and I have one passage in the futurist box. There must be a problem here. And that's the same way uh, with the study of Satan and the devil. As of this point, my box filled with uh, those who are simply in opposition to God's scheme of redemption is a lot more full than a serpent crawling in the grass whispering in Eve's ear. Amen. And so I'm trying to study this subject out more fully, but I'm just letting you know where I'm at now. I told Don, I said, I'm going to speak on the defeat of Satan in relation to the end of the millennium. And I knew exactly where I was going to go. Genesis 3.15, Matthew chapter 12, uh, let's see, uh, Romans 16, and Hebrews chapter 2, and Revelation 20. And I said, that's going to be my lesson. But I said, I'm not satisfied with that. I've got to do a word study. And boy, did I get myself in trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm in a transition period, if you will, at this time. But I'm going to present to you what I have. And regardless of what you believe concerning the nature or the person of Satan, you are going to walk away today with the, with the proper framework to fill in the gaps yourself and to see the, uh, the entire framework of biblical eschatology. And with that, be, with that said, we're going to begin our presentation today. That's the introduction. So, <laughs> In my opinion, our eschatology must be cross-centered cross and cross-determined. If an eschatology is not based upon what Christ began to do at his cross, then we are going to fail miserably uh, in terms of the latter part of our eschatology or the consummation of our eschatology. And we're going to develop this more as we move along. All of eschatology, as you've already seen in the lessons presented here uh, at Predators Program Weekend 2017, all of eschatology is directly related in some way or another to the work that Christ did on the cross. He was the first fruit of the resurrection. James said in James chapter 1 that him and the other uh, first believers were the first fruits of God's new creation, right? So eschatology, uh, the study of the resurrection, comes from the work that Jesus did on the cross of Christ. And it's going to come, through, come from these three stages of Christ's uh, end times work that we're going to be discussing here in a moment. The bringing in of the new heavens and new earth was initiated at the death of Jesus because he was the first one to be raised into the world above and into the spiritual world. And the disciples would come to understand that uh, during their 40-day uh, study session with Jesus after his resurrection. And in my opinion, the defeat of Satan is directly linked and must be determined by the cross of Christ. If we put the millennium beginning somewhere other than the redemptive work of Christ, then we're going to have an eschatology that is not cross-determined and cross-centered. Before I get to that point, let me tell you the three stages of the work of Christ in the time of the eschaton. In Hebrews chapter 9, 24 to 28, the scripture says this, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. There's stage two, the appearance of, of, God, of Christ in heaven before God to show forth his sacrifice. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with the blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There's stage one of uh, the age-changing eschaton. And inasmuch it is appointed for men once to die and after this comes judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly, uh, who eagerly await for him. Jesus' death on the cross was the first dimension of the age-changing eschaton. The apostles and the disciples of the first century, while eagerly awaiting 
the complementary second appearing of Christ, preached the gospel to all the world while Jesus appeared before God in heaven. The gospel that they preached is the power of God that would abolish death. The gospel is God's power to save, as Romans 1.16 says. This would be the power that God would use to defeat the adversary, also called the slanderer. And this gospel of the kingdom being preached to all the world would, of course, bring about the end of the age uh, within that generation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, indicating that Paul did not stray from, but he kept to the pattern set up by Jesus in Acts chapter 1. You go to Jerusalem, you go to Judea, you go to Samaria, then you go to the uttermost parts of the earth. As uh, some who are called the mid-Acts dispensationalists or the hyper-dispensationalists uh, teach, it was not a different gospel that Paul was preaching. He was sticking to the plan that Jesus had set up to restore Israel and to bring about the end of the age. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 3 through verse 6, we see how the gospel was very important in putting down all rule, all, all authority, and all power. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations, every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. So you notice that the uh, even the defeat of Satan, the defeat of the adversary, the defeat of uh, the slanderer. And I've done something there. Sorry about that. I, I think, I, I get, like you said, I got excited and squeezed it. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. There we go. The defeat of Satan is linked to the three stages of the work of Jesus Christ. It is linked to his death on the cross. And from that, the preaching of the gospel is being used to put down all opposing rule, authority, and power. And then it would be completed when their obedience reached its perfection. It would be completed at the coming of the Lord in AD 70. The word of God, as you know from even the prophets, was the tool that God used to vanquish his foes. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, God tells Jeremiah, I put my word in your mouth, and it was through that word that he would bring the nations to naught. It is the word of God that is powerful and that is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is the word of God, the gospel of Christ, God's power to save, that the apostles used to assist uh, the, age, the, the changing of the ages by putting down all rule, all authority, and all power. And that is connected with the defeat of the adversary and the defeat of the slanderers that were working in opposition to God's scheme of redemption. With all this being said, let's go back. That was part two of the introduction, I suppose. <laughs> With all this being said, having this proper framework in mind, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, to the very beginning, to see uh, what, uh, to see, you know, this framework for the defeat of Satan. In Genesis 3:15, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle. And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the hill. What this is looking forward to is the contention between the seed of woman and the seed of the serpent. And the, so the defeat of Satan, the defeat of the adversary at the end of the millennium, is directly related to the defeat of the seed of the serpent. If we can find where those who are called the children of the devil are destroyed, then we have the proper framework for uh, what the defeat of Satan is in Revelation chapter 20. Now here's a thought that I had, and I had this in the airport the other day, and I just put it here because I want to be transparent to let you know that I don't know everything. <laughs> Why would God punish every species of snake uh, if the adversary was simply disguised as a snake? Was it all the snakes' fault? Was it the rattlesnakes and the, and the black racers and all these snakes, the water moskins? Was it all their fault that the slanderer chose its species? You know, why wasn't it the owl in Paradise Lost, <laughs> right? But uh, that's just a thought that I had. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that some people might have the answer to that, but I'm still studying that specific issue. But anyways, due to the adversary's 
involvement in death entering the world. God introduced his plan to defeat the adversary by means of the seed of the woman crushing the seed of the adversary. And the Bible definitely identifies the children of the adversary, the children of the slanderer. Jesus, in fact, identifies them specifically as the Jews of his generation in John chapter 8 and verse 44. He tells them, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Well, what were, the, what were the desires of the father? Here's what he says, uh, of their father. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus identifies in this passage his contemporary, contemporaries as the seed of the slanderer. And it would be his contemporaries that would bruise him. It would be them that would stand in the courtyard and say, crucify him, crucify him. It would be them that would deny God's scheme of redemption and yell out. And can you even understand how they yelled this? I can't begin to comprehend why they would say this. But they said, we have no king but Caesar. How can you read 1 Samuel chapter 8 and stand before God and man and say, we have no king but Caesar? They were the seed that would go on to bruise Jesus. Which is why in the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter looks at these men and he says, You are the ones. You have with wicked hands taken and slain the Messiah. Now David Hester says in his commentary on Revelation 1-7, in his verbal commentary on Revelation 1-7, it was the Romans that pierced Jesus, but it was the Jews who with their own wicked hands put Jesus on the cross. That's who was attributed the guilt of the murder of Jesus Christ. Jesus identifies his contemporaries as this seed. And the slanderer was a murderer from the beginning. But who and how did he murder in the beginning? The death that he assisted in bringing about was spiritual death, or also called separation from God. This same message of death, now you really need to, need to see this. I was about to say catch the power of that, you're rubbing off on it. But, but get this, the same message of death was preached by the first century Jews. Go with me first of all to 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, and I'll show you that. In 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, there we see the, 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 uh, the idea of the devil and his angels. But that's one of those passages where our preconceived ideas of what the devil and his angels are get in the way of the true understanding of this text. In 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, Paul writes, For such men, and these are talking about men, they're false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, who ends will be according to their deeds. I think that's exactly parallel to the fallen messengers of 2 Peter 2, as well as in the book of Jude. Uh, but let me say this about, about this text here. What we see is it was, it was these people who are false apostles. It are these people who were kind of like in 2 Thessalonians 2, writing these false letters to the church at Thessalonica, telling them that the Lord had already come. They were those that Jesus prophesied about in Matthew 24. They were the ones of 1 Timothy chapter 1 who were using the law unlawfully. And they were the ones in 2 Timothy chapter 2 who were teaching that the resurrection had already passed and had taken place apart from the abomination of desolation and the ending of the old covenant age. In that way, they were using the law unlawfully. And so Paul tells Timothy, you better study to show yourself approved. You need to rightly divide. You need to work hard to, to show yourself approved by rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, calling back to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14 about these very men. I know that was a lot, but you, you can get it if you go back and get the recording. Just hit pause and play ten times and you'll get there. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15 show that it was, it was these first century Jews that were the ministers and were the, uh, the servants of Satan. Furthermore, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul talks about uh, how these same individuals were teaching a particular doctrine. But listen to what he says. But the Spirit expli explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, who was teaching this doctrines of demons? 
it were these Jews who were teaching, you can't eat this, you can't eat that, you can't be married, you must be circumcised in order to be justified, and you have to keep the law for justification. That's who was teaching the doctrine of demons. They were trying to bring about the same death that Satan in the beginning brought about. The lies that brought about spiritual death. That's what, they were, that's what their aim was. Which is why it's, it's said of Hymenaeus and Philetus that they've overthrown the faith of some. I hope you were able to, to, to follow that. When the Bible speaks of the adversary and the New Testament, um, and other phrases we generally attribute to the devil, such as prince of this world, and things like that, it is often speaking of those who rejected the gospel and stood in opposition to God's last day's scheme of redemption. The seed of the serpent can be traced throughout Scripture. Cain, for example, murdered his brother Abel. Cain went, on, Cain went about to establish his own righteousness through offering an unrequested sacrifice, and he was accordingly judged. The Jews of the first century who rejected the gospel and the inclusion of the Gentiles into the world above are said to be of Cain as well. Jude verse 11 says that uh, in particular. This seed is the seed that persecuted the prophets. They led the people away from God's plan. And it is upon this seed that judgment would come within that generation, as Matthew 23 teaches, to vindicate the martyrs, as Don says, to vindicate all the martyrs, all, or rather all the blood of all the martyrs, all the way back to Abel. And so it would be that generation that would receive the crushing uh, of the head of Satan. It would be that generation who were of their father the devil that would receive that judgment. And this gives us the proper framework, the proper framework for uh, biblical eschatology, the end of the millennium, and the defeat of Satan. The binding of the adversary through means of the age-changing death of Christ is directly related to the destruction of Jerusalem, or rather the destruction of the slanderer at the end of the millennium, at the destruction of Jerusalem. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15 says this, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also took part of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Well, through his death he renders powerless this adversary. Seems to me like putting a chain on somebody and binding them would render them powerless. Well, that's just me. Now, when he says flesh and blood, and I'm going to just tell you this, and you'll have to do the study on your own. I don't believe he's talking about this right here. If you look at the context, he's saying that he took on the seed of Abraham. Uh, and through taking on the seed, through becoming part of the seed, of, uh, becoming the descendants of Abraham, becoming part of this old covenant world, uh, he would die to that world and, re and deliver these people from the fear and the bondage that they had through that world. The adversary then was rendered powerless through the death of Christ. But in what regard? Well, in regards to his power over death. Through deceiving the world to the true nature and meaning of God's scheme of redemption, the slanderer ruled the air and the world below by keeping the people in a state of death through this deceit. And this was brought about through uh, emphasizing the lust of the flesh, the lusts of what John calls this world in 1 John chapter 2. And so in Revelation 20, verses 2 to 3, we see that the adversary is bound in order that he would deceive the nations no longer. The binding of the adversary through means of the cross event marks the beginning uh, of the millennium, in my opinion. Any eschatology that has the beginning of the millennium at a post-cross time fails to see the significant role of the cross of Christ in the changing of the ages. These are not cross-centered eschatologies. And they end up having Jesus return to remove the very thing that he died to establish. Amen. If the millennium began on the day of Pentecost, you do not have a cross-centered eschatology. If the millennium begins in the 1800s because you are the millennial harbinger, you do not have a cross-centered eschatology. If the millennium begins at the end of the Christian age, you do not have a cross-centered, a cross-determined eschatology. Jesus died, it's, Hebrews 9 says, Jesus died at the consummation of the ages for a reason. And to remove the importance of Jesus' death from eschatology is to obliterate biblical eschatology. The nations were deceived. This is what he means that he might deceive the nations no longer. The nations were deceived through masking the true nature of God's scheme of redemption through the lust of the flesh. This blindness can be seen at the base of Mount Sinai in the spies' unwillingness to enter the promised land um, of the earthly dimension of the Abrahamic promise. 
This can also be seen in the rejection of God as Israel's king in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And, of course, in numerous other Old Testament examples. Herod, a Gentile, who had been deceived concerning the true nature of the restoration of Israel and the world to come, sought to even put Jesus to death as a child. See, even the Gentiles were deceived by Satan in regards to God's eternal scheme of redemption. This is why you don't have thousands upon thousands of proselytes coming into the old law, you see. But whenever Jesus dies and this veil is being lifted in Christ, now you've got myriads upon myriads of Gentiles and Jewish, Jewish believers both coming to a proper understanding of God's scheme of redemption. This deception even affected the followers of Jesus prior to his death. Uh, the remnant was even subject to the deception of the adversary. It would not be until after the resurrection of Jesus that their eyes would be open to the true meaning of God's last day's scheme of redemption. Whenever Peter withstood Jesus in Matthew 16, Jesus was talking about the, uh, his death and his resurrection on the third day. And what did Peter say? Well, no, Lord, this, this can't be. What did Jesus tell him? Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, adversary. Because he had become deceived just like the Jewish uh, brethren had became, how his Jewish contemporaries had been, been deceived uh, to the true meaning of the uh, true meaning of God's last day scheme of redemption. Now, while the apostles understood the general framework, as I believe uh, a lot of the Jews did concerning eschatology, they still had misunderstandings concerning its nature. In Matthew 13, 51, Jesus asked, Do you understand all these things? That is, things concerning the end of the age. And they said, Yes, Lord. In Matthew 24, 3, therefore, they realized that when Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple, he's talking about the ending of their age. Uh, his coming again to, to consummate that age and to bring in the new. But in John 2, 18 to 22, we see that the disciples didn't understand the nature of the new covenant temple until after Jesus was raised, uh, was raised from the dead. In John chapter 2 and verses 18 through 22, notice we see that the, that the disciples were as deceived as the Jews were in terms of the nature of the things uh, of above. In John 2, 18 to 22, he says, The Jews said, said then to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. It wasn't until the post-resurrection time, uh, whenever Satan was bound, that the disciples began to understand the, the nature of the things of the world above and the things also of the age to come. It took the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus and his 40-day ministry to them to open up their minds to a proper understanding of the world into which Jesus had been resurrected. And we're not going to get uh, fully into that at this time. That should be 1 Peter 3:18. Uh, but Jesus was resurrected to sit in the heavenly places. I've got five minutes. I told you I had too much material. So the loosing of Satan. Okay. You know, I looked at the chart and it said, everybody's speaking times. And I said, he gave me less time than anybody. Now, we all had 45 minutes, but I need a lot <laughs> much more. <laughs> the message of the gospel spread like wildfire. Uh, and, but there were still some who were caught up in the wisdom of the world below. While thousands upon thousands obeyed the gospel call, there was coming a dark time into which a large majority would fall away. This is called the last days by those living in the last days. That is, it's the last days of the last days. It's the latter time of that age-changing uh, time period. Paul indicated that this apostasy would be led by an individual called the man of sin, the son of perdition. And when you go back to see what is, how Judas is described, He's described as the son of perdition. But who entered Judas's heart to bring about his uh, giving up of Jesus? Was it not Satan? So is the man of sin uh, that we see in 2 Thessalonians 2 not very closely related to the work of the adversary and therefore the loosing of the adversary at the end of the millennium that brings about this apostasy and deceives the nations once again? I believe so. Uh, let's continue on. Jude and John, however, indicate that this final deception that Peter and Paul said would begin in the last days, they indicate that it had already began. 
In 1 John 2, 17 to 18, he says, The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Children, it is the last hour. And then he points out the, that the Antichrist had arrived. Jude 1, 17 to 19, he says, You know that time period that the disciples told you about? Hey, guess what? That time period's here. You ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. They were going to deceive the nations once more. Looking towards the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, Paul said in Romans 16.20, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The body of Christ, who, had taken on the, who was taking on the nature, the divine nature of Christ, as the seed of Abraham, would soon fulfill the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. You will bruise the seed, you will destroy and crush the seed of Satan. And by that doing that, you will destroy, destroy and crush the adversary. It would be at the coming of the Lord that this final victory would take place. In Revelation 20 and verse 10, the Bible says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This defeat takes place after the nations were deceived once more uh, and turned their focus on the fleshly Israel instead of spiritual Israel. You have this persecution against the church. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the Jews are convincing the Romans, they're riding the beast to destroy and try to put down uh, the body of Christ. But what takes place? Then the Romans, they turn on the Jews and they kill the harlot. Now why do they do that? Because they were deceived. They forgot about who they were going after. Uh, because of the influence of the Jews, they were deceived once more. And so instead of focusing on spiritual Israel, they go back to focusing on fleshly Israel and putting them down. All of this would be accomplished at the time of the war, which Don has shown to be or will show to be. I didn't know when he would be speaking when I wrote this. <laughs> uh, it would be the battle which resulted in the fall of Babylon, which is the Jerusalem below. This was to take place according to the inspired writings of Paul the Apostle in the near future from the perspective of the first century saints. Let me conclude this and don't worry we got a lot more tomorrow. In my next presentation I'll answer the common objections to this lesson. We'll discuss more related passages and try to give more insight to the timing of these things. The defeat of Satan at being at hand in the first century is a devastating problem that postmillennialism has. Like amillennialism, postmillennialism sees the power of the time statements when it comes to certain subjects such as the kingdom of God and even the fulfillment of the majority of revelation in some cases. But when the time statements violate their presuppositions, there is no hesitation at all in them casting the time statements aside and saying we're going to have what we want to believe and we're going to throw away the time statements. Listen to the words of Kenneth Gentry in an article entitled, Why Will Satan Be Loosed? that was written on August 29, 2014. In Revelation 20, John focuses briefly on an ultimate eschatological events that look well beyond the short time frame of the book. Isn't that just a problem? How do you not uh, see an issue with that as you're writing that out? This is anticipated in his referring to the thousand years, which by definition must extend beyond the, beyond the near at hand time frame. Now how do you say Babylon is Jerusalem? How do you say that, uh, that all these things were at hand and understand the spiritual application of them, but when you get to the thousand years, all of a sudden it has to be little, literal? I'll tell you why. Because the scriptures violate your presuppositions concerning eschatology, so you have to throw out the time statements in order to hold on what you already have. That is a problem with postmillennialism, and Paul said that the defeat of Satan was at hand, and so I'm going to believe that the defeat of the Satan was at hand. Regardless of the nature of Satan, we cannot deny the words of the inspired writings of Paul. We will soon crush Satan under your feet, and let it be so. Amen and hallelujah. We have defeated the adversary, and we have final and full victory in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you very much.